This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dr. X17, Dustin Campbell, and Tim Deputy. Coming up on DTNS, Amazon's $5 a month unlimited prescription plan. More bad news from LastPass's parent company, GoTo. And Megan Maroney is here to tell us if it's a good idea to use ChatGPT to write your resume and your cover letter. The answer is maybe. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, January 24th. 2023 in Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Petaluma, I'm Megan Maroney. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Ch Megan, it's so good to have you back. <laughs> it's good to be back. I I love it here. This is a this is the good place. Aw. Aw. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, now let's reasons. get into some tech news. Yeah, let's talk about <laughs> Justice Department lawsuits. Yeah. <laughs> the U.S. Department of Justice and eight U.S. states filed suit against Google, accusing it of antitrust violation in the digital ad market. The suit says that Google has c control of tools used by publishers, advertisers, and brokers, and has used anti-competitive, exclusionary, and unlawful means to eliminate or severely diminish any threat to its dominance over digital advertising technology. Technologies. Google has cited Meta, Amazon, and Microsoft's ad businesses as counterexamples. We have competition. Uh, WhatsApp released a beta of its native Mac OS app for Apple's M series chips for Apple Silicon. Uh, people with Macs running on Apple's chips and using Mac OS 11 Big Sur can download the beta version from the Mac App Store. Those with Intel based Macs can also use the app uh, if they can run Apple Catalyst as well. Catalyst ports iPad OS apps. Tapbots, that's the company behind Tweetbot, RIP Tweetbot, okay. has launched an app for Mastodon on the iOS app store called Ivory. It's got limited functionality as of now. So you can't edit profiles, you can't edit posts, you can't read alt text through the, the although those are on the roadmap, says Tapbots. You can use it in read-only mode for free, where you can pay $1.99 per month to get full access. Blizzard's developer of WoW Classic, Brian Birmingham, was let go because of his opposition, according to Brian anyway, to Activision Blizzard's use of a stack ranking system. That is a system of productivity ratings that encourages competition among employees. In Blizzard's case, 5% of employees on a team had to be assigned the lowest rank, which would reduce opportunities and reduce pay and bonuses. Microsoft stopped using stack ranking in 2013. Meanwhile, World of Warcraft Hearthstone, Diablo 3, and all other Blizzard games have gone offline in China. This doesn't have anything to do with Brian Birmingham or stack ranking. It has to do with Blizzard's license with NetEase expiring. Companies in China are required to use a local company for a lot of online services, including gaming. Blizzard said it tried to get a six-month extension while it looked for a new deal, but NetEase declined. NetEase put out a statement, and in that statement called it, and I quote, Divorce, but still try to live together behavior. Well, we have new things in both uh, the big mobile operating systems today. Let's start with iOS. Apple iOS 16.3 launched for the iPhone with support for hardware security keys as a second factor. Those are hardware devices the size of a thumb drive or even smaller that use either USB-C or NFC. iOS 16.3 supports both with an adapter for the USB-C version. iOS will require two keys to be registered, one you carry with you and one stored at home or maybe an office as a backup. And Android 14 will fully block attempts to install apps targeted to outdated versions of Android. Google Play already blocks these kinds of apps in most cases, but they could still be sideloaded. In Android 14, they will no longer install at all. So to begin with, only apps targeted the earliest versions of Android will be blocked, with the plan to have the threshold at Android 6. However, manufacturers can change that threshold or turn it off altogether. All right, that's the quick hits. Let's talk about Amazon sending you drugs. Uh, Amazon acquired PillPack in June 2018. PillPack offers medication by mail without charging you shipping. They have a whole lot of robotic stuff in the packaging and stuff like that. Uh, but with PillPack, you pay your copay or, or whatever insurance doesn't cover. PillPack is still in business, though Amazon launched a separate service called Amazon Pharmacy in 2020. The online pharmacy space is pretty competitive these days. Uh, there are incumbents like CVS and Walgreens that offer similar features to PillPack where they can make 
mail you your pills. And companies like Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drug Company are trying to compete on price. However, Amazon took it a step further, launching RX Pass in the U.S. Tuesday. So if you happen to be an Amazon Prime subscriber, which will cost you $140 per year, you will pay an extra $5 per month for RX Pass. Then you can receive as many prescriptions as you have prescriptions for from a list of more than 50 generic medications. This is all for five dollars a month now you might say well what's my copay there's no extra cost if it's on the list and you have a prescription you get it for five dollars yes we are not kidding this was <laughs> a bit of some confusion at least for me this morning where i was like is this real five dollars a month sounds pretty great so you got things like blood pressure medication certain antidepressants hair growth pills among the list of popular drugs that can be sold as generic versions it's not insurance but you don't need insurance in order to use it either. Now, there are some restrictions. If you're on Medicare or Medicaid, uh, you cannot sign up for this because Amazon Pharmacy already provides medication through Medicare or Medicaid. And the U.S. makes it against the rules to offer a go around to Medicare or Medicaid. They're like, if you're sending drugs here, you can't send them to them some other way. It's also not available in eight states, California, Louisiana, Maryland, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Texas and Washington. Uh, and Megan, you you found in California, there's some rules about having to sign that maybe Amazon didn't want to jump through those hoops. Uh, and there may be similar stuff in other states. Also, this is interesting. You're locked in for the duration of your supply. So you can cancel any time. But if you just bought 90 days worth of pills or just got 90 days worth of pills delivered, you have to stay on the plan for 90 days worth of service. You can't you can't sign up, pay five dollars, get the 90 days worth of pills and then cancel. Uh, Megan, the, even so, even with these restrictions, uh, it seems like quite a bargain if you've got more than one prescription. Uh, how do you think Amazon is making money off this? That's a really good question. I mean, I assume they have deals with the um, drug companies. They're not, you know, they're they're generic drugs. So I'm sure they're making money that way. Um, I'm sure they're making money just because it's another reason to sign up for Amazon Prime. I just, I don't know if it's a yearly cycle. I just got my my bill for $150 a year, whatever that is. Does everybody get it in January? I don't know. But it's like every time I get it, I'm like, ugh, that's so much. Like I could just, like a lot of places are offering free shipping. What else do I use? And there's always like a TV show that one of my kids watches mm -hmm. or like there's something they get on Twitch that is free because of Prime and I just can't ever give it up. So I guess that this would be a reason if like you were a person that really didn't thought you didn't need anything else. But then that five dollars for all my prescriptions, I mean, that's conveniently delivered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm a Prime subscriber. I'm with you, Megan. Once a year, I look at my credit card bill. I'm like, what in the heck is this? I didn't do this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Amazon Prime. Dang it. They got me again. Uh, but $5 per month, um, you know, as somebody who has a variety of prescriptions, um, some of them might be covered by this. Some of them might not uh, for a generic version, if that's even something that you're, you're willing to do. That is a great, that's a great deal to the point where I was like, wait, what? We're not reading the fine print correctly. What is this actually going to cost me? Um, so it sounds like Amazon is saying, let's just get everybody into the prescription realm of Amazon. We got all sorts of offerings. Um, and RX Pass is the latest of those. And it will cover uh, a lot of folks who at least have uh, pretty common drugs um, or varieties of common drugs that, uh, that they might be able to take advantage of. I guess... You're losing money on this if you're Amazon right now, but uh, going forward, maybe it makes sense. I have a theory. Uh, I think that uh, what they're banking on is, let's say you've got five prescriptions and you look at this and two of your prescriptions are on here. You're going to say, well, that's going to save me money right there, even though it's just those two. So you sign up, you get those two prescriptions coming, and then Amazon is going to say, like, got any other prescriptions? Because even if they're not part of this, you can get them through Amazon Pharmacy at the regular rate, and we have competitive prices. And you're going to look and say, well, gosh, since I'm already signed up with Amazon, I might as well get them all in one package from Amazon. And you'll go to Amazon Pharmacy, and you'll spend your money there. And then once you're at Amazon Pharmacy, then 
you're going to see what else is at Amazon Pharmacy. Maybe some vitamins, maybe some stuff yeah. like that. In, mm -hmm. fa in fact, if you have a prescription for vitamin B12, which you don't need a prescription for, but sometimes doctors will, will say you have to take it, uh, that is part of Rx. That is part of this $5 a month thing. And if you're like, oh, but I'm also taking CoQ9 or, you know, some other multivitamin, you're probably going to want to get that through Amazon. So I, I feel like you're, you're both right. It's, it's sort of like keeping you into Amazon Prime, but it's also getting you to buy things on Amazon that you were buying other places as well. And that's why I think it's a, it's a limited list to say, well, we've looked at the tables and we're pretty sure that there are very few people that would have more than two or three of these at a time. So this is just the right amount to get them to sign up and then pay stuff, something somewhere else. Well, that's the model of CVS, right? Like you, everything in CVS is more expensive than it needs to be. It's more expensive than it is at other stores. It's like, guess well, I'm waiting for my prescription. Right. And then I guess I need Altoids. And also like, I also <laughs> need those almonds and that lipstick and a bunch of other stuff I don't need. And you buy it because you're just waiting around for your prescription. Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, we can ring you up here. You don't have to go up to the front. And suddenly it's actually more convenient to pay more for that thing. <laughs> because you had to wait in that line anyway. And I imagine Amazon is going to make that case even better because a lot of their stuff is not going to be more expensive. It'll be the same Amazon price that you would always pay, which is usually lower because they can buy in bulk and, and make deals with generic makers and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think this is insidious and interesting. What is it also possibly like their first step into, um, into being a insurance provider because some people like yeah. the only thing they really need for insurance is prescriptions. Well, and because they're not taking insurance, uh, they're avoiding the whole mess of having to be an insurance provider. So I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know that it takes them one step. I would think Amazon Dora would not want to even delve into that. Uh, They've dabbled in it before and back yeah, out. Uh, so this yeah, may be their solution to that. Complex. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, we got some uh, some updates uh, from LastPass's parent company, GoTo. Uh, remember, on November 30th, and then again on December 23rd, they gave us announcements about an unauthorized party accessing customer information stored in a third-party service. Both of those announcements had to do with LastPass. We've talked about that before. Uh, they, they got access to encrypted vaults, which isn't great, uh, but, uh, you know, those, those vaults are, are pretty hard to crack. Uh, we will be talking, uh, hopefully with Rod Simmons soon, about alternatives to LastPass. This story, however, is about other things in GoTo's portfolio. The update said that in addition to LastPass, attackers accessed encrypted backups from customers of communications tool Central, marketing service JoinMe, VPN service Hamachi, and remote access tool Remotely Anywhere. The affected information varied by product, but included things like salted and hashed passwords, as well as multi-factor authentication settings. Settings, not your MFA, but whether you had it on or off. In addition, MFA settings for rescue and go to my PC were also affected. GoTo said an encryption key for a portion of the encrypted data was also accessed, though they do salt and hash the passwords, which provides a little additional protection. GoTo will contact affected customers and advise them to either reset passwords and reauthorize MFA settings, or possibly they're just going to reset passwords. They've done that for Central and Pro users already and migrated those accounts to its enhanced identity management platform. Well, as a LastPass user, uh, I was... A, 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 a little taken aback from the news, um, you know, t towards the holidays of last year. Um, you know, changed some passwords, felt pretty good. None of uh, what this new update uh, has stated affects me directly. But uh, for anybody who's using any of these tools, now is a good time to... Go back and see where you are. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're, if you're feeling vulnerable, change some passwords and, you know, it, uh, and think about, you know, what password manager you're using at all. I know it looked really bad that uh, they announced the, the, the vault, the encrypted vault part of this breach from LastPass on December 23rd. Uh, and I'm not saying that they didn't 
time it uh, to to kind of fall in in the gap uh, of news or, or not. But what I am noticing is this is an ongoing investigation, and this this is an investigation where they're saying we know something happened, and we don't want to say what happened and be wrong. We want to make sure we know what happened and then act accordingly. And that this third announcement about that follows with that. I'm not saying it's good news, but it it does seem that they they're working with Mandiant to investigate this and responsibly disclose and protect uh, their customers. It's a bad breach. Don't get me wrong, uh, but but I don't think they're acting in bad faith. Folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? Uh, one way to let us know is our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We've talked a lot about the use of chat GPT and helping write things like CNET articles with varying results. Academic research papers is another one. But what about using it for something a little bit more prosaic? Something like, let's say, your resume. You might be looking for a job. You might have to write a cover letter for a job application. Well, Megan, you recently did an article for Fast Company looking into just this. What did you find out about how well this works? I mean, it works great. I think that uh, I'm amazed by ChatGPT. Like, I use it for everything. Um, tweets, <laughs> which, uh, you know, it's stories. Like, any any of that writing that is just so boring, like just stringing words together, it works perfectly. But you have to edit it. Like, it's a great, it's a great template. It's a great place to start, um, and especially for those tasks. Like, oh, staring at a blank page and just thinking, like, what am I going to write? It's great. Um, And so, yeah, go ahead and use it for all the times you're being asked for cover letters. Hopefully those are fewer and fewer times these days. But lots of people are looking for jobs right now. Now, uh, some HR companies already use AI tools in some capacity to help sort these kinds of applications. Do you feel like there is, I don't know, I don't want to say red flag, but but something where they go, ah, yeah, I, I know, I, I know what, what they're doing here. They're using AI to write their cover letter. Well, I think that it's, it's not an AI problem. Like, I think it's, it's that problem's been around for a while. If you've ever been hiring for a job and you read a cover letter, you're like, oh, you just cut and pasted this from a template or like you did, you have no personality or you don't know how to like translate your personality into the written word. Like, so it's not like an AI thing. Like, I think chat GPT is not unlike bad writers everywhere. It just has more access to information. <laughs> but I think um, what's interesting, one thing that I learned that was really interesting, because like, the question I wanted to answer is like, okay, well, we know that employers are using these tools and you know you have to put certain keywords in your resume or you're never going to get seen. And so what, isn't it fair for us to also use them when we're looking for jobs? And what I learned when I talked to people um, who work on those kinds of applicant tracking systems, ATS, that's what they're called, is that they're not really as like they're not using AI as much as people sort of think they are like it's really just a tracking system and humans are still really looking at resumes um, by and large to decide if people are qualified for certain jobs so yeah I think um, I do think that those humans will be able to tell that might be able to tell that it was written and not edited but I mean, the, the recruiters, one of the recruiters that I talked to, Alexandria Brown, she runs a site called the HR Hacker. She basically said, you know, like if you're using technology to work smarter and not harder, like good for you. Like <laughs> I applaud you. Those are the kind of people that I want working for me. So I think that that I found pretty fascinating that a lot of recruiters are just like, yeah, cover letters are kind of dumb. Nobody reads them. And if you found a way to hack the system in that way, then maybe you're someone I want to hire. Now, before the show started, uh, because you have access to chat GPT, um, we had a little bit of fun uh, thinking, okay, well, if Megan Maroney um, was looking for a job and wrote a cover letter that chat GPT actually wrote, what would it say? Um, said lots of things, uh, very nice things about you. Megan Maroney is a well-known podcaster and internet personality, the host of the popular technology podcast iOS Today and MacBreak Weekly on the Twit Network. Megan has a wealth of experience in the technology industry and is known for her ability to break down complex tech topics into easy to understand language. Sounds good, right? In addition to her podcasting work, Megan is also a frequent guest host on other technology-related shows and has appeared on major news networks such as CNN and Fox. 
Fox. Her expertise in the field and engaging personality have made her a respected voice in the technology community and a popular figure among tech enthusiasts. Now, this sounds like you, Megan, but uh, how much of it is accurate? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's absolute. Like ChatGPT is kind of a liar. Like I've never been on CNN. I've never been on Fox News. I didn't tell it I had been on either of those places. I was never the host of MacBreak Weekly. I'm no longer the host of iOS Today. So, no, like, yeah, a lot of it is just simply not true. And it's like the audacity of ChatGPT to just like <laughs> make sure, stuff yes. up like that. Yeah, you're like, thank you, but no, Chat. <laughs> so what I think ChatGPT is best for is preparing a thing that you can then launch off of. And I think that that what you found with with people with the HR folks that you were talking about is many of them are like, yeah, if you use it as your first draft and then you go in and get rid of the inaccuracies, uh, the lies, uh, and, and maybe like add a little of your own flavor to it, then that's great. It's saving you time. Uh, it, a lot of people just don't are like, I don't even know where to start. ChatGPT is great for that moment when you're like, how do I even start this? Ask ChatGPT to write it. Then you'll look at it and go, oh, well, I should change that. And that's not right. Oh, and it didn't include this, which I hadn't thought about till now. It kind of gets the juices flowing, right? Yeah. And it, I mean, it's the same thing that if you know how to like write a cover letter or resume, like you look at the job description and you say like, oh, OK, well, um, I have those skills in that thing. I know Ruby on Rails, like I have six years of management experience. I've, you know, and you, you sort of cut and paste those and put them in your cover letter. But like what ChatGPT does really well is you take the job description, you put it in and then it spits it out. And so like I, if this, if this were mine, I would say, well, like I have, you know, delete the part about being on Fox news and CNN and, you know, and add, I was the host of iOS today mm -hmm. instead of I am. And, you know, you just go through and then, and you know, it's the same thing. You have to edit it because if you don't actually have those skills that they're asking for, and then you lie and say you do have them, then um, then you get elected to Congress. <laughs> exactly. I was like, how political can I be? I'll let Sarah. Be <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, uh, if if you, it depends on the job, and it depends on how much time you want to put into it, whether you should use this. But but you're saying that that it's probably good for 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 a first step. Yeah, the only person that I talked to that was like, no way, was uh, he He owns a like a, a branding and advertising company. Like words, he's like, words are literally our currency. Like, mm. we're, you know, we want you, they're, they're doing the, the job of like writing creative things that people still want to read. Yeah. And I mean, even they were like a little bit like nervous about, well, you know, is this going to take our jobs? But he's confident that like they can still write better than a robot. Do we even need we'll cover see. letters? If if you've got a machine processing the cover letter and a machine writing the cover letter, like at what point do we go dispense with the fiction that we need this anymore? We're right, not covering exactly. anything. It's, You're not mailing it. I, I know. That is the thing. It's like you think about it. It's like why was it called a cover letter? Because it covered up a res resume that we printed out on this like really thick – paper that was expensive and resume paper and then mailed it in the mail and we don't do that anymore so i mean you still need an email introduction so you know there's nothing wrong with throwing a few things into chat gpt and having it help you out a little bit yeah no one needs to know if you if you rewrite it in your own voice you know it's just just helping you with that first draft mm-hmm well, speaking of uh, figuring out where people are in life, Carnegie Mellon University scientists have developed a new way to sense humans through walls by using two Wi-Fi routers. <laughs> Do we have your attention yet? In a new paper, the researchers explain how they used a deep neural network called DensePose that maps phase and amplitude Wi-Fi signals to UV coordinates. So a 3D model surface is projected in a 2D image for mapping a computer a generated image. DensePose was created in coordination by Imperial College London, Facebook AI, and University College London. But Carnegie Mellon researchers can now accurately map multiple subjects' poses with a simple 1D sensor, in this case, Wi-Fi antennas, instead of a more expensive LiDAR or radar option. The researchers say the Wi-Fi approach to imaging humans in households could be applied to home healthcare as one obvious example. Yeah, we've we've seen uh, research out of MIT similar to this, I think, before, and we've talked about it on the show. It's it's the idea of 
monitoring the way signals are bouncing off of people. And, and you could do it with any kind of signal. It's just that if you've got Wi-Fi, which most people do these days, that's the most prevalent signal that you can use to monitor. And then, yeah, uh, immediately our, our minds jump to surveillance and, and privacy violations. But there might be reasons you want it to know just to, as simple a thing as is the person in the room that could be used good good for smart home stuff where when you ask it turn on the light if it knows like oh you're definitely in the living room and we can we can pinpoint that uh, yeah. it helps improve accuracy and things like that along with the they always give the example of like you know monitoring an elderly person to make sure they're okay are they standing up that kind of thing yeah it's good stuff yeah all right let's check out the mailbag this one comes in from Stephen, speaking of surveillance. Stephen says, not so much feedback as general wondering here. I was sitting in my home office when my landline rang. Of course, I'm a normal, hu normal human, so I ignored it. The built-in answer phone picked up. Then it dawned on me, so I immediately unplugged my smart speaker. I almost felt paranoid. That I did the right thing, possibly? The thing that occurred to me, says Stephen, is how much of the olds have answer machines and have helpful millennial children that have bought them smart speakers. I did a quick look online. Of course, there are many exploits, but I wonder how many times this specific hack may have been used. Makes me think of the old school payback phone rehackers. Yeah, payphone hacks. Uh, so... I actually didn't understand this at first when Stephen wrote in. I was like, what? Uh, what are you unplugging the smart speaker for? Because the answer machine could trigger something from yeah. the smart speaker. For anyone who doesn't remember answering machines, uh, if someone doesn't pick up, they play out loud. Uh, yep. That's where call screening originated, is that you could hear them talking on the answering machine and then decide to pick up uh, if, if you wanted to talk to them once you knew who it was the, in a world before you knew who was calling by their phone number. Uh, and so they still work that way. And there are still people with answering machines, probably not a lot. Steven's right. Uh, but there could be a system to go after people with answering machines and activate smart speakers to get information. Now, I'm not sure what, it, when there's a vector, someone will find a way to exploit it. So the fact that like, well, you can't hear what the speaker says. So you can't use it to have the speaker tell you things. But you could say, like, unlock the door, you know, just try stuff and see what mm -hmm. works. You know, there, there's certainly there's certainly a vector there. It's a small subsection, but, yeah, it's something to think about. I mean, even yeah, who has a – go ahead, Megan. Uh, who has an electronic door, a smart lock, and also an answering machine? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean <laughs> – Exactly. Like, yeah. It, it would, the, the, it starts to get narrow and narrower. And you're like, how many people have answering machines? Not that many. How many people have ans who have answering machines also have a smart speaker? Well, okay. That, that gets even smaller. How many of those people have someone who wants to target them, uh, and, and use that to do something? Uh, you start to wonder like, well, I guess you could just mess with people and make their smart speaker play music. I don't know. I, I, I bet there's something I'm not imagining, though. So if you are like, ah, this is how you could exploit that, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Indeed. My mother is a person who has a landline, an answer machine, and also a smart speaker, mm -hmm. but they're not all in the same room. So I was like, mm, I think we're good in mm -hmm. this particular case. But, Maybe you know, you never know. something to I, think about. I have smart speakers answer me from the other room sometimes because I don't have Wi-Fi monitors that can tell I'm in that room. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Stephen, for the feedback. And if you ever have questions, comments, uh, something that we might talk about on a future show, do send it our way. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Thank you to you, Megan Maroney, for being with us today. Always a pleasure. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, I'm MeganMaroney.com, uh, Megan Maroney on Twitter, Megan Maroney on Instagram. Um, and yeah, and I've mostly been writing freelance for Fast Company. So you could just Google Fast Company, Megan Maroney, and then read all my stories there. Um, also on LinkedIn, which I'm enjoying a lot lately. Nice. Are you? Mm -hmm. Good stuff. It's, a, it's, it's the new Twitter. <laughs> Haven't you heard? It might be. <laughs> Everything is. Jury's out on that one. Uh, well, we uh, we love having you with us. Please come back early and often. Uh, we also want to extend a special thanks to Hector Bones. Hector is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. We couldn't do it without you, Hector. Thank you for Thank all the years you, of support. Hector. 
Indeed. Speaking of patrons, do you stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet? What will we talk about today? Only the moon knows. You can also catch this show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'd love to have you join us live if you can. And we'll be back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>